diver, as a matter of fact, quite a few divers have died in these, these waters looking for sharks to eat. My name is Jason Owen. I'm a megalodon hunter. I run uh, Sea Island Divers, which is a dive shop. We teach scuba, we do service, and of course, we hunt shark's teeth. When I was in college, I uh, worked for uh, the museum uh, at the University of Nebraska, and we did some, uh, some fossil hunting there. Um, that's how I kind of got started and, and interested in it. Um, when I uh, moved to Beaufort, South Carolina, I met a guy by the name of Vito Bertucci, who was known as the Megalodon Man and uh, he hunted shark's teeth here for about 30 years. He taught me how to find shark's teeth, he taught me where to hunt them, um, how to spot them, how to find the, the pockets where they've collected as they've washed out of the fossil bed. A megalodon jaw. Megalodon was once considered as the apex predator of the ocean when it swam the seas roughly 2.6 million years ago. It's also the biggest predator to ever have existed on this entire planet. Megalodons could reach up to a staggering length of 52 feet long and weigh a massive 100 tons. Thankfully, this terrifying species of shark died out around 1.5 million years ago. The famous fossil hunter Vito Megalodon Bertucci spent nearly 20 years of his life trying to rebuild this megalodon jaw. Made up of 182 fossilized teeth, this is the largest jaw ever to be pieced back together, and it measures in at 11 feet wide and 9 feet tall. Bertucci found the fragments amongst various rivers in South Carolina. He's a bit of a legend, yeah, in this area he certainly is. Um, I remember when I was in third grade, he was on actually on National Geographic on one of their programs. Um, he was also in a newspaper that they distributed through the schools. So I actually read about him when I was, you know, a kid and then to actually grow up and be able to dive with him and, and meet him was, was a neat thing to be able to do. I started diving for fossils when I came here to South Carolina in uh, 1993. When I got here, I got invited to go on a dive. Matter of fact, at the same site where we're going today, um, we got invited to go out and I went down there, got there early, was all excited. I'm getting back in the water again, going to be hunting some stuff, doing something new. And uh, I go down there, I walk out on the dock, and I look at this water that looks like something like a cross between pea soup and chocolate milk. And uh, I just thought to myself, there was no way anybody could dive this. I, I wouldn't even get in the water that day. Um, I watched this uh, instructor that invited me to go and, and uh, his students go into the water, and I was sure that they were just absolutely not going to come out. If you get out far enough, the, the bed is actually exposed there. It's more of a rubbly type material. Um, and once you get there, you'll be able to just see the stuff laying out if there is anything. So you just want to cruise over that area and look for anything. You might see a, a point, a, a tip of the tooth sticking out, maybe an ear. You may see the whole tooth laying out. Uh, but I can almost guarantee you're going to have some growth on it, whether it be the sea web or uh, some sort of incrustation over it. So it may not look exactly like you know a tooth laying on a table, but um, it'll be it'll be there. You find a lot of partials there. You find some neat colored teeth there. Some of those nice tans and, and reddish colored teeth. So it's a fun site to dive. Um, it's pretty easy access. Uh, you just have to make sure, just like always, go against that current. When you pop up, you're going to have to swim like mad in toward the bank because the current's going to be dragging you back. You know, without lights, you're not going to see anything on the bottom. Uh, visibility is somewhere around six inches to a foot, foot and a half, depending upon the time of year um, and how warm the water temperature is. Um, we lose all ambient light from the surface, usually within about five feet. Uh, from the surface. By the time you're five foot down, it's completely pitch black without your light. It came time that I was all suited up. I had my tank on. I was ready to rock and roll and um, excited. Um, and I jump in the water and then I s probably made it 10 feet and I realized you just lost a serious sense. Um, all you're hearing are knocks and creeps. I'm like, oh man, like I can't even see the rope that I'm trying to go down. I pop back on up. Um, and uh, I was quickly made fun of because I didn't turn on my flashlight, which um, so I couldn't even see the rope. It just scared the crap out of me, and I popped right back up. I was like, man, that's freaking gnarly. I don't know how anybody has the balls to get down there, 
Um, and I was quickly informed that you need a flashlight. And far as sharks go, when we were shrimping, trawling, they would, some of them, I've counted 18 inch bites in the nets where the sharks just destroy our nets. You know, they, you just got, you got to fear them, but you got to love them. But I hate to fall over and we anchor at night and turn our lights on to clean up for the last drag before we go to bed. And the sharks are thousands and thousands around the boat. And it's freaky. It really is. It can make it dangerous. It can make it, uh, you know, it just freaks some people out. They just can't handle it. Um, what really makes the dive in here dangerous, though, is the currents, the heavy currents that we have to deal with while we're having that low visibility. We're down on the bottom in the mud and the muck. We overweight in order to be able to stay down against that current. And um, with the low visibility, it's so easy to panic, and that's what, what gets people in trouble. Just guessing 10 or 12 foot, swimming underneath the boat, probably 100 at a time. Seen tiger sharks, don't know if I've seen white sharks or not. They all look the same from up above, you know, looking down on them. But I have seen the tiger shark come out of the water and grab the seagull off the water right behind the boat. Went down and the seagull come back up, so the bird got away. But he was probably 10 or 12 foot. Nasty looking thing. As I'm going down, I'm like, holy crap, it's absolute sensory deprivation. It's, it's, um, you can't describe what it feels like because you're 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 surrounded by pitch black darkness with current ripping, knowing that if you let go, you're going to get swept out. Um, and um, more than anything, you you're in shark infested waters and you can't see more than two feet. Um, it, it's it's terrifying. It was exhilarating, and um, and then quickly all of the words of advice that I was given shortly before started running in my head, and I went, "Oh crap! Oh yeah, I'm I'm still in really really sketchy waters. Um, you can only see two feet in front of you, even with a really high powered light, and." Um, one of the, the big uh, dangers on the bottom are stingrays. <laughs> and, and unfortunately, you'll, you'll get right on top of them before you see them and they'll barb you. So I slowly start creeping around the bottom trying to fight the current. Um, you, have a, you have a shovel or some sort of digging tool and you have to dig it into the ground and, and use it kind of like you're working up a glacier, pretty much, um, as you're fighting this current. And uh, eventually I found one of those spots that, um, that everyone was telling me about. And um, so I positioned myself there and uh, started digging around um, a technique that's called fanning, where you end up blowing all the top uh, sand, all the light stuff out. Um, and then you reach this, uh, it's like a clay, a uh, pretty thick clay. And you start trying to go through there and digging your way through and trying to find anything essentially that's black, shiny, and shaped like a tooth. And um, I want to say probably 10 minutes went by after I was digging in this one spot and I found my first tooth. And it, it wasn't some massive, massive tooth or anything, but I, I remember grabbing it, having it in my hand, um, and kind of questioning if it was real, because it was just so wild to come across uh, a fossil, a, 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 a dinosaur bone, a dinosaur tooth. Um, and uh, I'll never forget the excitement that I felt there, and I was immediately addicted. Um, all, all of your fears, all of your worries, they, they don't matter when you have one of those bad boys in your hand. It's just, you're immediately addicted to the sport. We've got a few of our finds over here. Um, probably one of my most favorite is, is of course, the big megalodon shark's teeth. Uh, this one is a little over six and an eighth inches, which is the biggest I've ever found. Uh, they've been found over seven inches. I think the biggest right now is about seven and three eighths, but um, big animals. Um, to give you some comparison, this is from a great white very similar to what you would find in a modern day, a uh, great white of about 20 feet. And this is a megalodon from one that was probably well over 60 feet long. 
The serrated uh, thresher sharks, they're the rarest of what we find. We've only found them, they're only known to be found in one area, which is right around here. We found them in uh, one river system off the broad. Um, they are, um, they're just the rarest of the sharks to eat. Our fossil bed here is somewhere between five and 15 million years old, um, is what the geologists tell us. And unfortunately, because we don't actually go down into that fossil bed, for us to tell the time frame on a particular tooth is very hard to do. The color has to do with the minerals that were around the fossil when it, when it formed, whatever leached into the pocket left behind by the, uh, the bone that rotted away that's what formed it, so it gives it color. The Bandinis are one of the rare sharks. They're a type of uh, thresher shark, we believe. Um, they've been, they're very hard to find. I've found maybe eight of them in 20 some years of diving. Wow. So they're not uh, the, the most common, but they're, they're a pretty cool little, uh, little tube. If we leave them out in the river, and this is what people don't get, if we don't pick them up, once they've eroded out of the fossil bed, it's only a matter of time before they're gonna get destroyed. Mm -hmm. And moving back and forth in that sand, they're getting sandblasted, uh, they're getting thrown against in each, uh, each other, and they're going to get broke up. We find tons and tons and tons of stuff that is broken and fragmented. Depending upon the river, it could be nothing but sand within a few weeks after it's eroded out of the bed. With the low vis, running out of air is probably the, the, mo the biggest concern, and, and it happens. Um, you get so focused on what you're finding that... Um, you forget to check your gauges, watch your gear, uh, so you end up losing track of where your air is and next thing you know you're out and you're 30 feet down in a current and you've got to fight your way to the surface. Um, that's probably one of the most dangerous situations, um, especially since we're overweighted. It's happened to a couple of my divers that have been out with me and it's happened to me at least twice. Um, not a fun situation. Um, Several divers, as a matter of fact, quite a few divers have died in these, these waters looking for shark's teeth, hunting for shark's teeth. Uh, you have to, if this is something you're going to do, you have to understand what the risks are and you have to accept that this is outside the norm of regular diving. Um, you have to accept those risks in order to be able to do this. This is Vito Bertucci. He was a member of the Marine Rescue Squadron at the same time that I was, and he was a noted diver. He contributed a lot to Port Royal. And Vito lived around the corner from us, and um, he dove in the area regularly. Um, he was he was instrumental in re, re, replicating a megalodon jaw. He created the jaw, and then from findings of teeth, individual teeth, from numerous dives in numerous places over years, had found the teeth that would fit in all the places, which is like, kind of blows my mind. I had to stretch my arms to, to touch both sides and pretend like I'm in the mouth of, you know, this Megalodon. He was just a great guy and it was uh, so sad the day that he was lost, but he died doing what he loved, which was diving. I truly consider him a scientist, an artist and a scientist.
sweet.